it's hard to become an expert. There's no real training. There are courses and certifications and regulatory, but I think a lot of it is just experience. You know, it's, it's, it's going into meetings with FDA when you don't have all the data. Welcome to CMC Live. This is the show where we discuss CMC regulations and guidances simplified through real-life experiences and risk-based advice. Each episode, we speak with subject matter experts as well as other leading industry authorities. With your host, Ed Narkey. Welcome, everyone, to CMC Live. Today, we have a special guest, actually three special guests. One of them is Ed Narkey, myself. As always, we have Brian Leo and Miranda Paris Gondola and today's podcast we're going to have a Q&A to get everything out of my brain. Hey guys, how you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Good, real good. So, I was telling Brian or, or somebody the other day, I'm for those new to our podcast, we have done I think this is about 10th episode now. And um, there was a ton of things that if the podcasts were available several years ago, when I was much younger and had a lot of the information still in my brain that I could have shared that would have helped. I was telling people my experiences over the years. And I stopped doing that, I guess, when I started moving more in the business development side with Miranda here. But I think they're worth talking about. And I think talking with you guys with some of your um, frontline hands-on experiences with some of our clients and customers and authoring uh, their their marketing applications, it could help draw out some of those memories and also some of the useful information and things that I learned over that time. So I provided some ideas for you folks. You guys have a lot of questions. So as a high level, um, coming in from regulatory operations side of things, I know what most of this means, but I don't know really the origin of how it came about. So I I get the pretty package at the end that you guys scrambled to get together. Common technical document, what is its role in drug development? Why was it, what did it originate from and the purposes? And that's part of where I began my, where I was born in regulatory. Uh, I think it was circa 2000 or uh, 2005. I have somewhere in between those five years, but I worked at a large integrated, vertically integrated company that was involved with a lot of other large vertically integrated companies to create a new standard out there. Prior to that, there was a different format for marketing applications as well as INDs that didn't really have a rhyme or reason and it wasn't consistent across global regions. So Europe had something that was looking different. So anytime you had to file something, and I'm mainly talking about the CMC, the chemistry manufacturing control section, you would have to cut things out of one thing and put it somewhere else. And sometimes there was no sections equivalent. So the International Council on Harmonization, the ICH, pretty much got together and developed this thing called the Common Technical Document, which it's international, accepted any uh, any of these markets, Japan, anywhere in Europe, in the US, and a lot of other countries. It's, it's in other words, an, a way to harmonize the look and the feel of the application where information's nested. So reviewers in any market could have, have access to any of the, the development and compliance information, whether they're looking for it or not. And in some instances, they rely on other countries, other markets that need certain things in certain areas to vet that. And a lot of times there's reciprocation and, and approvals, and I won't get into that. But anyway, the CTD module three mainly, and the module two uh, quality overall summary, they're the the basis for the chemistry section, which is the the story and the, and the evolution around the materials that go in, not just to the clinical trials during the clinical studies, but also what goes out to commercial approvals. So INDs, you know, I, I was talking to you folks a little bit prior to this call. You know, it's just my firm belief that any company that submits an IND should essentially use that as their blueprint and carry that as their blueprint moving forward throughout their program, whether it's a fast track program that happens over six months or whether it takes 10 years to do. But mentioned to Brian, I was involved with many programs and so were you, Brian and Miranda, you know, where we, we get involved with a, a program and they they want us to help them author an NDA or a BLA. And, you know, they th- think that they have everything together, but we find out that they have, these are, these are drug sponsors. They'll have an initial IND and they'll have a, a slew or a giant number of <clears throat> PDFs that contain CMC information amendments. That's change control in development over the course of development. And a lot of times, you know, it's not uniform. A lot of people lump these together. A lot of five changes at one time, they'll submit it. Sometimes they'll do it in the annual report. Sometimes they'll actually forget to submit changes. So whatever they have in their documentation, their module three, it may not be reflective of what the current process is, what the specs are. So during development, there's it's a little looser criteria and the uh, compliance. You know, as long as you're 
dosing patients with material that's been formally or informally accepted, you know, through updating the IND, it's not a big deal compared to when you're actually on the market and you're selling this to maybe hundreds or thousands of people. You know, I think it becomes a much more compliant issue at that point. So essentially, that's the role of the CTD. It's to harmonize the, the different pieces and the different information bits for a drug product. So it's all in one place. And for each market, you know, you can find it in the same exact area. So, Ed, then with that understanding, can you maybe talk a little bit about the evolution of CTD from an IND, say, to an NDA? And I know uh, they're markedly different, but but how are they different? Right. Let me expand on it. When you submit an IND, which is required to to, to run a clinical study, to dose a patient, that's, that's part of the um, requirements. You have to file an IND. And I won't speak to the clinical or the non-clinical or the safety issues like that. We, we are not experts. I'm not an expert, although I don't know a lot about it. But filing an IND is important to get a trial started. And folks start clinical trials for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's to get on the market and sell something that they could sell a lot of and make a business out of it. But more in, along the lines in other cases, there there's an unmet need out there. There's a therapeutic need that's not met by a, a current product out there. Or there's a product that's not necessarily the safest. Um, but it's you know it's the best standard of care, or there's nothing out there, and there is no standard of care. So it's really important to get an IND open, and that's also a value chain for any biotech company. Um, as you know, any any company that has an open IND, there's more value than if it has nothing or a concept or something in in the, you know the early drug development research stage. Let's just say with potential. So. You know, like I was going forward before, it's really important to kind of identify, I guess I would say, you know, if you're submitting an IND, you know, if you have a small team, start by, you know, generating what type of information you're going to require. There's going to be a process for your active. Very simple. It's it's the ingredient that you get to put into something that, you know, sort of makes the efficacy. Um, You're going to have control of that. You know, you're going to be able to make it somehow. You're going to be able to control it, which is going to include your, your acceptance criteria, which are your specifications, which are going to be somewhat uniform hopefully between batch to batch. So you're going to have to hit these these milestones, whether it's a, a certain level or keep certain impurities under a certain level. And these are tied mainly to the safety studies that you'll have to do preclinically. So every batch that you make from that point on is going to have to have, uh, it's going to have to meet the same requirement or you're going to have to rerun testing, tox studies. And that happens on occasion. Sometimes you scale up and you can't make the same material. Sometimes it's dirtier. Unless you can bridge that and show that there's no safety issues, you may have to run tox studies, which are costly. So the truth is you want to define where your your specifications are based on your manufacturing capability early on. The next thing, you know, you're going to look at container closure. Those are storage units, you know, whether it's a vial, a bag, anything. Usually with an API, it's a drum with a plastic bag inside. Um, and I can talk to the drug product in a bit. But And that goes on to, you know, stability. Uh, that's something that's v- very lightly required early on because you're not going to have a lot of stability data. You're not going to wait two years to put something um, and get full stability data without knowing that the it has, you know, any potential in the clinic. So on the drug product side, you're going to have a composition, which not only talks about the active, but any excipients in the drug dosage form. And it also depends on the dosage form that you're dealing with. So I won't get into the minutia there. It really depends. But, you know, there's a lot of things that involved with the excipients, which are a big um, discussion point if you have novel excipients, which means that they've never been used in humans you know, or, or food products or cosmetics. In that case, you know, you may have to do additional work or you actually may have to document that process, how to make that excipient, because just like your process to make the API, you know, any changes prior to a certain point could affect the impurity profile, which could affect the safety profile. So if you have a common excipient that's used in other products, whether it's emulsifier or any any type of you know excipient for use, then you wouldn't have to put so much information. On the process side, the same thing with as the API side, you know, you're gonna have your process for drug product and you can make that in a number of ways depending on if it's a if it's a sterile filled product or if it's if it's a solid oral or if it's some sort of combination product. These these are just really recipes on how to make this consistently. Somebody should be able to read this as a reviewer and say, okay, I get it. They should understand it's very common you know, to make a, a solid oral capsule. So in the, uh, in the IND stage, fairly simple. And then the same thing, you're going to have acceptance criteria to, to meet and match what you've done before. So you'll have your specifications. Early on, it's very loose specs, not many. There's core uh, ones that are well-developed in the guidances and well uh, laid out in the guidances. And you also have a chance, usually in a pre-IND meeting, to discuss these type of things with uh, the FDA, you know, especially if you don't want to set very uh, stringent and stern specs if you don't have a lot of manufacturing experience. And then also on the stability side, same thing. Any dosage form 
formulation develop type of thing. Any any information that you can gather from that work, able you should be able to use that for your stability for the IND. And I think the message I'm trying to get to here, and I'll slow down in a little bit, is there's a lot of information that you can get over the course of that plan. And I think that's what I mentioned in the beginning. If you write this down on a piece of paper, each of the areas, what you're expecting in each of the areas, when you're going to get the data, how much you're going to get, and what you don't really need, but you know, put that in the parking lot, that becomes your next plan, which you can turn into your regulatory strategy document, which eventually, if you tie that to this and update things as go- you go along, like I said in the beginning, you have your, your NDA. So I won't get into the, the different phases of development. Sometimes they're they're clouded. You know, a lot of folks think they're later than they are. Some folks get breakthrough and are later than they are. It's really about, you know, you have to look at when you think you can actually get your final patient in, get that pivotal study done, get that data. And that could be anywhere from a year to 10 years. Sounds good. I do have a question and it's not related to the new drug development side of things. Um, but coming from a generic background, a, a DMF is a drug master file um, and it could be an API or it could be a uh, component within your full ANDA. For the IND, um, since all the clinical trials have to happen, does that get referenced from the NDA or does it kind of more like transition from an IND to an NDA and not really referenced as much? Do you use a lot of that information? Excellent question. And I think these are questions that came up in the past that I used to be able to nail, but let me think about that one. So a drug master file is not associated with an IND or an NDA or anything, actually. It's its its own entity, and there's different types of drug master files. So the one I think you're referring to is more a, t- a type 2. Yeah, for API, correct. For the API, right. So and that's the most common. So in general, drug master files are filed for a variety of reasons. Um, one of them, if, if I can recall, is... You know, it's essentially if you're making an active that's going in multiple different products, maybe different sponsors, different companies are using an active. One might be formulating in this way and using it there, and another may be doing it this, this way and, and doing it there. Usually a manufacturer will file a drug master file for that reason so they can maintain and update that with the changes. They can control it, essentially. And, that, and that's, a, that's a good thing for any sponsor because they don't need to worry about the compliance. They might have to generate another analytical section, especially if they take material and further process it or test it to certain you know, different set of specifications. And that's a different topic. But usually the, the manufacturer wants to control what type of information goes in there. And usually that's a good thing because when they're making changes, they can update that fairly fairly easily. I used to, I think that's where I started in regulatory. I used to update drug master files because I worked for a API CMO who held many of them. And then the second part of it is a business um, decision. Most CMOs want to hold a drug master file for a couple of reasons. They have you locked in there. So you don't really know their process. They might have an open section that they share with you, you know, that you would need. And then there's also a closed section. Maybe it's a proprietary uh, process that they certainly wouldn't want um, their competitors or anybody else to to learn any information on. So drug master files can be referenced um, via an IND. Basically, you need a drug master file letter, DMF letter that you can get from your vendor. Um, It just certifies that everything's up to date. And it also, it's, it's routinely referenced in, in NDA submissions, thus allowing you not to have to rewrite the drug substance section. Unless, again, like I said, there was an analytical piece or some additional information that you, you're you required to provide because you do some extra processing on your on your product. Oh, thank you for clarifying. I always um, envisioned it to be, okay, so you have the drug substance, which is a DMF, and then you bring it into your um, NDA. So I was thinking the IND was something to that effect. But eventually, once exclusivity ends, typically the um, sponsor would probably have a closed DMF. Yeah, that's, I, I have to admit that, you know, I, for the last 17, 19 years, I worked in drug development pre-approval. So I, I don't want to say much more on, you know, because I haven't really followed how things change. I could certainly tell you a little bit more about other drug master file types. You can find them routinely to find. Uh, there's four types on the uh, FDA's website if anyone's interested. So to step back a little bit, and we talked about, you know, the IND and the contents, and then Specifically in terms of the NDA, and and this is sometimes we wrestle with clients and getting them to understand that that level of detail and completeness. Um, when they say, well, it takes X number of hours to put together an IND, why indeed does it take that much more to do an NDA? You're still writing in the CTD, you're still there, you know, but but it's the the depth of information. So could you just at least at a summary level describe why that NDA takes the time it takes to write? I mean, it's not I know that it's it's different than an IND, but but how? 
some of these sections are very involved, very lengthy, and a lot of strategy. So could you maybe cover a little bit of that? And that's a common question. And for anyone who's developed a drug and had you know a hand in CMC departments, whether it's authoring or strategy decisions and those things like that, you know usually that's not the that's not the part of the program that's emphasized unless it becomes a problem. I think that's the start of it. It's not the it's not the priority. Let's say I think the clinical studies and safety issues are are, are really the the focus of the company, and not many companies have folks to tend to the CMC. So I think the the general answer is to kind of define two different types of companies. One of them is like a vertically integrated large company, large pharma that has resources that generates their marketing application, their module three from the beginning. They file a very well defined IND with just enough information uh, in it to, you know, have an have an IND open with no compliance issues. But they're sitting on typically they're sitting on a, a, a large amount of uh, research and development data that they're either going to use later on or they're never going to use because they're going to change things. So, but they have a ton of it. They purposely don't file it in an IND, and this is why most folks shouldn't file too much, especially things that are going to change because you're mandated and obligated to update that information anytime it changes. Cause concerns if somebody looks at it, a reviewer looks at it and finds something else, you know, you obviously want to make it streamlined. So the most part of, you know, the folks, the more, small emerging biotechs, and you know who you are, you know, you either inherit it, you have inherited an IND that was filed many years before and the therapeutic area has transformed or, you know, out of academia, we see a lot of this, you know, very, very light and dirty information, very little information filed into an IND and then very, very little information generated up into the point where you actually get to a phase two or three where you see efficacy data and suddenly you have to file an NDA, you know, because you have clinical efficacy and it's it's powered to show that there's some improvement. So you'll see that you'll have an NDA and you're, or you're, you, you, you plan to file an NDA and what you, work, you start with is an, is an IND that has maybe 5% of what's required in the NDA, all the conformance information, all the story from the beginning, you know, how you became, how you got this process, why the process is under control, how the process was scaled, if it needs to be scaled, how it's scaled, how it's controlled, how changes to anything in the process affect the control of the product. You know, how the methods were uh, selected, why they're qualified, where they qualified, how were they validated, justifying the specifications. You know, you can't just pull out random numbers and say, you know, plus 90%. There has to be a rhyme or reason. Early on manufacturability, you know, you don't want to set your specs too too tight because you'll fail every batch and you're not required to set them too tight. Again, you're supposed to relate it to the, to the toxicology work. And as long as you do that, shouldn't have a problem and you shouldn't have to run studies each and every time. So the, I guess to, to go back to just general answer to your question, you know, typically the NDA is is just not, the IND is not developed properly to get to the NDA. So thus you're going to have, you know, a lot of work to put to put an NDA together. I'm, I'm trying to come up with an analogy here. You know, it's almost like if you, if you want to build a, a, a massive, great seven room beach house, right? And as an investment property, you want to sell it, right? Well, when you when you submit your plans, you know, to, to you buy the property, you submit your plans, and the thing they require you to do is put a fence around it so no one falls in a hole in the middle, and that's all you do. Well, when you want to sell it, you know, when you're when you're looking to to unload it after you know you're done building it and getting that, that value back, that's all you really have. You have a fenced in yard with a hole in the middle, and that was fine for you know that that time. But you know, if you want to get your your money back out of it, or if you want to, you know talking about patient population out there, if you want folks to be able to use it properly and get the most out of it, you know, where it's on the market, you know, at some point you got to put um, efforts into building the, the house. And that takes, you know, one floor at a time, different materials, depends on what you want it to look like, you know, what colors you want, what, those are things I think you can equate to drug development. You know, you can put as much into it, make it as, as great as you want to be, or you don't have to. So Actually, to build a little bit on what you said, so you talk about a plan, you know, referencing the fence as a plan. A lot of times when we talk to a, a client, we'll ask them, are you filing just in the U.S.? And the answer is absolutely, or we're pretty sure, or we don't really know. So we, we like to tell people that when we write these NDAs, we write them considering that they may be filed in in other parts of the world. What does it mean to have rest of world awareness as you're authoring and developing your NDA? Great question. 
uh, Brian. Um, when I started off in regulatory, big pharma, there was US, there was Europe, they each had different divisions, and there was ROW. And guess where they plopped the young uh, Ed Narkey? in the ROW space. So it was a lot easier. Literally, we didn't do a lot of decisions. We weren't very strategic with the FDA. I never went to early meetings early in the career. You know, I would basically get everything that was already done, written, and I would I would go and apply for a, a certificate. Um, it's called Certificate of Product Performance or C- C- CPP. I don't know. But anyway, when, when a region in Europe would um, get an approval, you know, I would request that. I would put together a, a, a dossier, redact it, and I would send it to ASEAN markets in Asia or uh, NEMA markets, North Africa, Middle East. Rest of world awareness. I think, uh, you know, bringing that conversation to currently how we operate and, you know, 20 years later, biotech, there's a lot of value in, in each of these regions, um, you know, for, for companies that are developing a product that they want to license out. Um, you know, they want to take in consideration, you know, if they want to submit something in the U.S. and get approval, they might want to take that to Europe. There's a patient population, for example, there, maybe for what they're doing. Or they may find a partner that, you know, they license out rights to Europe or other regions. Um, and then those folks, they might have more experience getting approvals in those areas, those regions. So what you'll want to do is <clears throat> this, the CTD is intended to serve as a common global structure for drug development, as I mentioned, for the documentation. And there are regional differences that exist in requirements. So, for example, uh, U- U.S. is a, a new drug application. A lot of us know what that looks like. Um, we can find the guidance, as I touched on it earlier. In Europe, there's something called the clinical trial application, CTA. And that, you know, there's a lot of clinical stuff, as, it, as the letter word says there. Um, the portion of that, that that is the CMC portion, is it's called the IMPD, the Investigational Medicinal Product Dossier. It's very similar to the IND Module 3. In fact... It's kind of the same, actually, I would say, except for there's regional differences that exist in requirements. So if you are planning to take your product either simultaneously or ultimately, you know, through a partnership, you do need to know some of the regional differences. There are certainly stability requirement differences and even specification differences. And then if you get into biologics, there's quite a number of significant differences. But if you're planning to do, you know, even the rest of the world, you know, again, you'll want to take your regulatory strategy document out and also make sure you're aware of what those requirements are because, you know, it wouldn't be great if you can develop a perfect product to submit and get approval in the U.S. and then you're missing 10% of it and it takes you another two years to, um, you know, get an approval in, in other markets. Um, and it's partially a business decision. Um, and there are a couple things that um, come into play with pediatrics and um, IP and exclusivity and reimbursement. So there's there's a lot of business decisions involved. So again, from the regulatory perspective, you know, you'll want to think about that Um not just on what you put in it, and, you know, decisions that you make, things, timing and stuff like that, but what are the ramifications for the business in general and building a value there? Okay. So, and that, that actually leads to yet another question. So, you know, you talk about a storyboard, you talk about um, a long-term strategy, but but the submission itself actually has to convey everything that a reviewer is going to want to know about the product. It's going to have to tell a cohesive, complete science-based story. So, you referenced the use of, of storyboards. What are they? And and when's a good time to use those in the process of authoring? Okay, so storyboards brings me back to 20 years ago, let's just say. Again, at Big Pharma, where I, I sort of got some of my initial training. Um, and storyboards are kind of what they are. If you if anyone's a, a movie buff here or watch how movies are created, you know, you, there's a there's a storyboard involved. Um, but I think in our purpose, and Brian, I think maybe you should talk about some of our process because I think we've kind of translated that to how we do things virtually, you know, across channels such as email and literally over the phone where we're not in the same room. So when I was growing up in Big Pharma, you know, we would have a representative from each team. We would have a regulatory rep and we would have a technical person who was either a process person, maybe an analytical, maybe a QA, someone from business development, someone from marketing, you know, and everyone would be, and not everyone would be involved with the writing of each of the documents, but if there was a tablet, for example, and we decided to, you know, it has to be embossed or it has to be some ink put on it to make it, you know, a brand or whatever, this would be fed into a a story, I guess, in a sense. So someone would be standing in front of the room with a white flip chart, you know, writing all this down, almost like a a flow. And that would be translated into sort of a process, which would be translated into deliverable. Um, You know, and I think a lot of it from my end as a regulatory 
um, person who needed to put this together and actually file it, you know, we just wanted to make sure the alignment of messaging was up front. You know, what, what needed to be carried out and done and put into the CTD was transparent. So everyone was on the same page. Data that needed to be generated and when was, was obvious. Um, have all the important issues been addressed, right? You know, versus just generating data uh, ad hoc, uh, haphazardly, and then at the end just saying, let's pull it all together, you know? Um, and then does, does, does all the data align across all the sources? So, you know, just I'm not going to get into the, too much of the details, but, you know, if you're doing something here, how does it affect over there? And the same thing, vice versa. And then it's it's messaging. Um, I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the things that you could do for any uh, marketing application or your, your IND or investable application is, you know, tr- transform the storyboard. This is the basis or the foundation of your quality overall summary. You know, talk about why you're not going to follow a certain guidance, you know, so you have that message, that answer, that story, literally, when you get that question. Or maybe you don't get the question because you've addressed it. That's that's the foundation of data tables and, and those type of things like that. There, those, those things come from source information, raw information. They start to flow and to become the messaging. That's the art of writing a, a submission. Yeah, that kind of goes back to some of the podcasts we had recently with our team here. Make sure that you tell a story from the outside because they haven't been there in the process, right? So in those storyboards, you also take into the regulatory agency perspective. Like, how do you think of them on the outside? Do you, if you have a large team, do you go to another team and say, hey, does this make sense to you? Or do you look for outside help? What's your recommendation there? Just depends on the dynamics, I assume. Yeah, uh, that is a phenomenal question. I don't know how you thought of that one, Miranda, but that <laughs> that is a great question. And you know, that's one of the things with our regulatory colleagues, Brian, you know, it's hard to become an expert. There's no real training. There are courses and certifications in regulatory, but I think a lot of it is just experience. You know, it's, it's, it's going into meetings with FDA when you don't have all the data, you know, when you have to address issues, gaps in development where nothing was done, you know, where you need to get a, mar- a product on market because it is efficacious. So the reviewer on the other side, you know, whether it's Europe or, or US, they definitely have two different review techniques. One's top down, the other's bottom up. Throughout the life cycle, this is, goes back to the, the submission, the, the piece, the IND, the maintenance of it, right? Anytime you're, you're doing any of this, you know, if you, if you own a product or you're looking after a product, you know, throughout the life cycle, it's important to keep in mind the agency re- reviewer perspective. They do not have a daily conversation with you. In fact, sometimes you never talk to them for a couple of years, right? And they just don't know your product. When I first early on in, in regulatory and I first got into the U.S. regulatory, this was 20 years ago, I think, they actually allowed you to call your PM at FDA or even sometimes the reviewer just to ask a simple question like, hey, we're finalizing this. That stopped suddenly when, you know, basically they became overburdened, underfunded, and they all started working from home. So that does not happen now. There's a process. It's very formal and it's it's kind of convoluted. And no one knows if they're going to get the right answers. And usually if they do, it's the day before some something pivotal or maybe they don't before they have to make a decision. So I always say the agency reviewers, part of your team, whether they're there every day or not. So you ask yourself three questions. This is what the reviewer, many re- reviewers have told me this too, right? Where does the sponsor want me to go? So you have to lead them. Okay, they're reviewing something. You have to lead them, right? And then the, the reviewer actually said this to me once, where does the science tell me to go? So you have to make sure those two things are aligned. And if you do that, you know, usually you don't have a lot of questions. And then I think what the reviewer and also the the sponsor should ask each in, individually, and it should align, what does common sense tell me? And this is where I, I mentioned earlier that no one has to do everything. You know, I, I did work for a, a large Swiss manufacturer who really generated tons of data because that's the culture there and you know very very great you know s- stories to tell if, if anything happened batches failed you can go back but you know common sense tells me that if I have a certain product it's fairly simple to make and control then I'm going to be doing what I need to do to get that thing on the market so the patient population could benefit from that and then you can also come back later and improve process you know cr- increase your yields scale it up where you can make it quicker, faster, whatever. But you want to make sure that you're in line. So what does the sponsor want? What's the science want? And what does it tell you? And then the common sense part of it are, are key things to think about from perspective from either side. Okay. So now with all that being understood, we get into the space of authorship and QC of sections. And and you've described kind of the company mindset, the company process to get to this point. Where we come in is a bit we're outsiders. We're not, we don't have all the institutional knowledge that say the client would have. 
And not each client has the capabilities in-house to write their NDA. They all want to be a part of it. They want to go through that learning curve, but they don't have the experience. And the one thing you'd said several times is that the, especially as it relates to common sense, is that's where experience really kicks in. That's where everyone seems to think they know what the FDA is going to do because they read it somewhere. But if you really think about it, it comes down to how many times have you done it? And when you're talking to people, you know when people have done it before. It doesn't take long to sniff it out. So when you talk about authorship and QC, how do you describe that process? That's right, Brian. And I'm going to ask you to say something to how we currently operate afterwards, because I think we've developed a really nice hybrid model. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, you know, when you have a large building and a lot of conference rooms and a lot of people that are experienced, it's sometimes it's a little easier. But now that I say that, you know, it wasn't that easy. Um, so just a couple bullets, I would say, you know, there's there's a cross-functional team aspect of it. You know, no no regulatory person has done everything in drug development. So they, they highly rely on technical experts, subject matter experts who, who kind of can read the data, interpret, and maybe expound on it. So, you know, generation of like a cross-functional team, whether it's two people, if you only have two, you only have two. But if you have a few more, um, that's how we operate here. We have a lot of technical folks that kind of come in. You know, you, your, your plan, I guess, is to generate high-quality documents um, and they need to be improved over time, as I mentioned, through a series of reviews or discussion. Um, that's not always the case. The luxury is, you know, you have all your information. You could build it, write it up, discuss it, improve it, get more information. And a lot of times this, this rule is loose. I mean, you know, having a team is a luxury and having, you know, many reviews is a luxury. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. But, you know, common sense, that's kind of how you want to operate, whether you're a one-person company or you have a large company. Some of the other things, I think, just in my dealings back in the day, I haven't done a lot of authoring at all. And maybe you can talk to this. A lot of it's document quality control, authoring in QC. That's that's the way I look at it. You know, we, we've we dealt with some issues over the years where we were told that, you know, we have data and this and that. And, you know, it starts with getting the actual available source information, which is the GMP documentation, which is the batch records, which is development reports, which is specs, methods, whatever. Those are things that, you know, I, I would say that, you know, any anywhere early on, no matter what you're doing, if you're starting an, an authoring project, you want to take an inventory of what you have versus starting right away, just jumping in, because some things may kind of interrupt how you write things, or they may have you the greatest order to write things. You may want to, you know, sort of take things in, in spurts. Um, to tie them all together. So you want to have a content review and you can probably talk to about how we do that. And you want to get a group consensus too. You know, you, you like you said, there's different personalities. You want to get a consensus on how that material and information is going to be put together and, and cross-reference because what a lot of folks do is they write things up from information. And when there's questions during review, they don't know where the information came from. So it's it's kind of an organizational exercise. You know, you'll want to do some data accuracy check, especially for source information that's that's questionable. And then ultimately, you're going to want to format it. And I won't get into that. That's just making it look smooth and pretty. That's the fun part. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the funnest. That's the part I used to love the most, because at the end of the day, I knew whatever I finished that day, it was done. And I finished it and I was done. <laughs> um, I hate it when I wrote something and, you know, you would always have one or two, I wouldn't say stupid questions, but, you know, just questions that it kind of annoyed you. You're like, okay, it's a style thing, right? And then the formatting at the end, you know, you want to make it look you want to make it look good. Um, every one reviewer said every submission that they get from X company looks the same, feels the same, tables are the same, whatever. And it was Merck. So that, you know, again, large company had the luxury. They do this. They have a team of reg ops people that do this at the end. Any company that's trying to do it, you know, just have a one-off. You don't have to put standards or SOPs in place, but, you know, make sure it looks good because it does reflect on the, the, the actual data and content in there, just like anything in life. Yeah, Brian actually tells an excellent story of either his past company or maybe a client here or there where they had everything, right? They had everything ready for us, right? They had everything ready for you. You walk into the office and there's about 16 filing cabinets and said, here you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they all say that. No, you're right. You're right. Every, every, every prospective client starts out by saying we have everything we need. They all do. Um, and our approach is a little different in that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're coming a bit in from the outside. But what we offer is we offer that team, Ed, that you had mentioned. When you have the smaller departments internally, they don't have the resources to truly check and fact check and make sure the science supports the statements being made and all of that. And, and it's critical. 
So what we do is we we look at it, we basically run the project and we structure everything based on the CTD format. And w- over the years, we've been doing this a long time and we do quite a few per year. We realize that a lot of inefficiencies are built into the beginning of a project. When you go into a client's e-room or they say, here's, here's all our files, good luck. One of the problems is that the file, something as simple as a file name, you look up and you'll say, okay, there's report XY002. You have no idea what that means. You have to open it. You have to read the title, and then you have to determine where it goes. And it may seem simple, but if you factor that in, just the sheer number of documents that are required to support an NDA, you're losing valuable time. So what we've come up with is a model that's basically broken down from CTD. So we will start with a predetermined checklist of documents broken down by section. So the client who knows their own documents very well, they'll put them in a file transfer site based on where it needs to go. That cuts down a lot of the back and forth and a lot of the, 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 I hate to say wasted time, but it is, it's wasted time. And now you've got all of your source for information broken down by the sections that they need to be broken down in. You ask for all, all agency correspondence, anything that paints the flavor of the document that you're going to write, any past commitments that were made, um, any future commitments that are going to be made. You want to have all of that and it builds in to add your point about the storyboards because we're not there with that group of people that that flipping that chart in that conference room. Sometimes this is just as good, though. When you have all of that that source information, you have the regulatory expectations on top of it, you have a flavor for how this will be written. And what we do is we'll start off with an author, a regulatory author, who will start to pen those sections as a draft. And then we'll have our technical person QC those sections against the relevant source information. I can't stress this enough. It's not just do the numbers match what goes in the table? But are the assertions made in the technical documents, particularly around development, method development, are they relevant to what's being written? And do they tell the story? You want to get credit for the work you've done. And sometimes getting that out of that source and uh, document is not easy to do. And then after that, there's comments, there's back and forth. And then you have that regulatory strategy check on top of that to make sure you're telling that cohesive story. And then from there, we send it off to the client. And that's where they do their review, where we would all be in a room. We don't have that. They review that document. And versioning control is essential. You make sure that you control what goes over and you control what comes back. And then your project manager works intimately with their project manager. And then you can track the ebb and flow of these sections. Some sections are lumped together you need to have them to do an effective review. So some things are staged. Some information is not available. So where you can, you make that placeholder. And we talked about this, I think, early on in the conversation, the importance of a placeholder. You write enough of the section where you still can do some work on it and then drop in information. Uh, typically, batch analysis table or stability sections where you know you've got data coming, you just have a placeholder for it. And that's how you write that. We also advise that we don't touch the quality overall summary, the module two section, until module three is understood and agreed to. Because otherwise you're now tracking two different changes at the same time. It's it's difficult to make sure that that QoS truly represents the, the module three section. So we're able to come in and really provide an extension of what the client wants to do with the NDA. And I think it's really important to know that it's a collaborative effort. It's not us taking their information and dictating this is how it's going to be. It's a learning curve for both parties to a degree, but it really is a joint effort. And and that's really how we've managed to do that kind of virtual model where we can almost as though we're in the room with them. Right. And I was going to ask you a question about a quarter way into that, but I think you answered it. And that was the, the contributions of each functional area. I was trained by some of the finest regulatory submission content authors like ever, right? There were a combination of European folks that did this for 20 years in the old format. And we transitioned, you know, like I mentioned, I, when pharma changed to the CT, the common technical document, I went to every meeting to discuss each section and why and how. So it's very clear. But two of the things I just wanted to highlight, and I, I just had just a memory, subject matter experts, you know, authors, uh, reviewers. This is how we work internally now. And I see how you've um, how you operate and how our team operates. You know, folks 
need to stay in their swim lanes. That's a, that's a common cliche these days, but I heard that 25 years ago, literally, you know, each sub team person, you know, have to understand their responsibilities. This is what, this is why we talk about efficiencies. Um, this is what our group does really well. I could say that, you know, with a lot of pride, people have responsibilities and they leave others to theirs. And then the document review part, we, you mentioned it there, how we operate with those things. You know, we're not, every reviewer can uh, review every aspect of a document. There's certain individuals involved, right? Folks with the most project familiarity, you know, obviously they're the ones on the project and reviewers who are naive to the project also play a role in some cases because they, they see things that certain people don't see. So that's a good point you made, Brian. Brian, I gave you all my documents today. Can you turn it around in two days? (laughs) But um, realistically, what's timelines of submissions? Do you wait until you have everything or do you start drafting what you can? That's a great question. Um, and it's one we're asked all the time. So really, if you think about it, you, as the author goes through the process with the client, there's still another piece and that's the publishing group. So a lot of decisions and a lot of milestones are based off of when a submission is, is, um, when an application is submitted. So really you have to work backwards from that. Uh, Publishers routinely will give you, we need four weeks or better in order to hit your target date. Everything has to be in by then. So realistically to dump it all in at once, it doesn't work. It never works. There are sections in CTD that we consider to be low hanging fruit. And we really encourage to start writing right away. Um, bigger sections to take longer. That's where, as mentioned before, the placeholders there are essential. And you want to keep the momentum of the writing going. If you if you stop, pick up again six months later, there's continuity issues. You have to make sure that terminology hasn't changed. That th- those really long, drawn-out processes, that they're difficult to manage. But the sooner you can start and get that low-hanging fruit done, the better. When it comes to timelines, the really important thing for us is to have transparency for each section as it's being written. And then to make sure if you have a critical path item, you're tracking it, that you know to the week you expect to get that information. And from that, the week you expect the draft to be generated. That way, all parties, both within our organization or or the sponsor's organization, know it's coming and they can fast track it to make sure we hit a timeline and not stress the folks at publishing. That's right. One other thing, to, uh, Brian, as you remember and you recall every day. So, you know, working out differences in interpretations before anything's finalizing in documentation, you, ne- you never want to come back and change stuff because you're not on the same page. So before you finalize, you know, there's there's discussions. And then you also have to remember, this is a very stressful time. And we know this. We, ha- we haven't had a, a disagreement or anything like that ever, right? So you have to be flexible and supportive of your team members. You know, when you're working with external parties, sponsors out there, it's very, it's easy for them to get uh, frustrated or upset because missing data or this, you know, delays something. It's part of the process. So Brian, you brought me back to my publishing days where I was just waiting for P8 to be done and waiting and waiting. And then you could just submit right as soon as you've gotten all that in there and did all your hyperlinking. So yeah, I hear you there. So I'm so happy you gave me four weeks to do it. As far as timelines go and the quality, can you tell me a little bit more about that? So typically a lot of things are driven off of, we need to submit on this date. So if I was to come to you and give you two weeks to do something, what would you say? It's a good point. So if you think about it, you have timelines versus the quality um, of the submission you're putting in. And what point? at what point do you draw the line? Um, you can do it quick. Um, you can do it well, but bottom line is at what point do you make, do you make concessions timeline versus quality? At what point do you, you say, we are not ready. This needs to push that sort of thing. Ed, can you kind of expand on, on where I think that line moves all the time. It's very project dependent, but, but how do you broach that subject? Because so much is at stake on that filing date. Yeah, and I'll I'll sort of lead into, you know, maybe tracking progress where I think you have really have a lot of experiences with um, you know, different dynamics and different circumstances of, you know, and we can get into those as well. But timelines and quality, right? So that's that's the main thing. What could we have this by the end of the year? Could we have this in 2 months, you know, and how fast can we get it? So, I guess the question again, the general question is how long does it take? I think I got that question every time I talk to somebody whether it was early days of Big Pharma, another group that wanted to file it, or small biotechs now that want to serve their board and you know and that make announcements and stuff like that. So I think it's just that that means the fit for purpose. Is it when it will be ready to file that when it where it's approvable? And I'll go back, you know, I'll kind of touch on it again. It really should 
be being built over time, right? And that'll help alleviate a lot of these these issues, the last, last minute decisions, discussions, bottlenecks. So the right answer, how long does it take? The answer is it depends on how much time is left. So if you only have three months to file it and that's the goal, you got to get it in for three months, right? It's not the ideal thing. The reality though is quality must be part of the process, right? So you have resource constraints, conflicting priorities, maybe missing data. Things move up really fast sometimes without you know, any, any reason, you know, you just want to blah, blah, blah. You have a partner or whatever, you know, quality control checks need to be built into the timelines. And then the question always is, you know, when is the actual document done? We talked about this a little bit. If you're missing a little piece, what do you do? Right. Most assume it's when it's approved. That's when it's done. Right. Cause you'll never know until somebody reviews it. Right. And then Miranda, you can come back here, you know, regulatory publishing and e-submissions prep that that's a big part of the ending of it. You know, be mindful that that does take a little bit of time and you know, it's important part of the interlinking and process for a reviewer. So I think I think it's important. One thing that like you mentioned that that three month scenario, that's where a cross functional team is really important to have checks and balances throughout the process to ensure that if you are moving at a good clip and you're you are trying to get four months worth of work done in three months, having those internal checks and balances in in your system and your authoring workflow is is essential. And how efficiently you remediate comments and questions? Do you wait until there's an end of week meeting, which we advise you don't? You have targeted focused meetings and you get something done and you move on. So it really, you can affect the quality if you're working in a, in a condensed timeline by using those those checks and balances from different disciplines to look at the submission. I think it it really does help. So Brian, tracking progress, you are (laughs) not so much anymore, but you have have seen this, right? Microsoft projects sometimes involved, right? Project tracking tools, you know, you have to follow documents, you have to manage resources, authors, reviewers, QCers, approvers, publishers, etc. Timelines, timelines and interdependencies, right? Can you give us a little bit of a kind of a preview or your daily operations when you're working with a, a submission project? Yeah. You know, you mentioned about um, how stress level and anxiety slowly ratchets up at this time, especially as you near that endpoint. One way to alleviate that or at least minimize that is to be able to give an update on any given subject or any given section at any given time. Once you do that, it does two things. One is you'll get your answer. And two is it just instills a sense of confidence in the whole team that things are being tracked. And What we do on our side is that we put together a project tracker. Now, I know everyone's got a project tracker. Ours is specific to the CTD, where if we have a critical point, we we will highlight that. We will update the sponsor weekly on the status of that critical path item that impacts that section. And if we have to move things around, as Miranda, as you mentioned, as P8 comes trickling in at the end, we make sure that that is truly the last thing you have to do. But it really is important to track every aspect of a section as it goes through the workflow, from authoring to QC review, um, remediation, client review, and also formatting. It's important. And what people don't seem to understand is that it doesn't just stop at formatting, because if there is a review to make that section final, if something, if, if someone so much as makes an edit that it could impact all of your linkages, your tables, and everything could change, and it could generate another six hours worth of work that people don't see. So having that uh, transparency per section throughout the CTD it helps it just helps everyone overall sometimes it is a bit cumbersome and 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 labor intensive but in the long run it pays off especially when you're working in a relatively condensed timeline so we're getting close to the time here and one last thing i'd like to bring up it's not a question it's just a sort of an observation and we've all seen it following the nda submission it ain't over yet there's things that you need to do. You think think about this. We talked about the beginning of an IND, you know, generating enough information, a story, building a story, building chapters out. Preparation. Uh, when you submit this, there's going to be questions. So, so prepping for agency questions can be done all along the way. But, you know, normally once you have your filing, you're going to want to do another gap analysis if you haven't done it. You're going to want to address anything that, that hasn't put in there because it's going to come out. You know, you may be able to justify certain things in the quality overall summary, as you said, Brian, in the end. You know, prepare for responses, prepare the, the, the anticipated questions. So when you have questions come up, you know, you're not spending weeks and months or you, maybe you can never find an answer. Yeah, you, ha- you have a game plan, right? 
that's the end of this uh, podcast here. I think we did a fun job here together. I think that if any folks have any uh, comments or concerns about this, or if have any questions would like to speak with us, feel free to reach out or hit subscribe below to capture or listen to future podcasts. We'll be back shortly in the next couple of weeks with other podcasts on this topic going into more depth and detail about submission content, some of the pitfalls and some of the areas that are hot topics before and also now. On our next podcast, we are joined by Dr. Daniel Torak, a seasoned synthetic organic chemist. Dan has served industry for over 30 years in many aspects of development ranging from synthetic to process development chemistry. He's hands-on, he's results-oriented, and he's focused on process development, CGMP scale-up and transfer, and CGMP commercial production. Dan will be talking about women and plants that is person and plant. Dan will also share many of his travel experiences from over the years, both for business and for pleasure. Dan was a mentor of mine when I was younger. I am very much looking forward to this conversation. So check it out. Thanks for listening. To read the full show notes for this episode, which include a summary, timestamps, and any links mentioned in this episode, please visit dsinformatics.com forward slash podcast. There you'll find the information from this episode and any past episodes. If you're enjoying this podcast, please leave us a rating and a review at ratethispodcast.com forward slash CMC live. We'll be sure to read these out on future episodes.